Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't ready for that. Hold on a second. What do you mean you weren't ready for that? It's, it's not in the notes. You don't read the notes. <laughs> I sometimes read the notes. Yeah, when you're glancing for something when I ask you and you need it. Can it give me a minute if you're going to ask me something with words in it? <laughs> The advice provided on this podcast is general advice only. All statements made are considered by the participants to be accurate, but accuracy cannot be guaranteed. It has been prepared without taking into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. All participants in this podcast may have a financial interest in any or all of the products or securities mentioned. Before acting on this advice, you should consider the appropriateness of the advice, having regard to your own objective, financial situations, and needs. If any private products are detailed on this website, you should obtain a product disclosure statement relating to the products and consider its contents before making any decisions. Where quoted, past performance is not indicative of future results. Welcome to episode 27 of The Money Path with Bob Iaccino and Mike Arnold, founders of Path Trading Partners. I'm your host, Stafford. Today's What and the Why segment is sponsored by MotiveWay. Go to pathtradingpartners.com and download your 14-day free trial. So now let's join Bob and Mike with a conversation that's already in progress. Bonds been all over this life this morning. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to call Bonds. Uh, Rick Santelli was actually funny this morning when I was watching for the jobs number. We had a jobs number, by the way. Yeah, we did. When I, when I was watching for the jobs number, Rick was like funny. He's like, oh, yields are screaming. They're 1.49 on the 10-year. <laughs> Jobs number came out insanely strong. Well, yeah, they're so low that it's funny, right? What are you talking about? What's so low? The yield. Yeah. You- thought you were talking about the jobs number. No. Well, to your point about the jobs number, the moving average has recently dropped from like 240 to 187. So remember how a while back you were saying the trend is down? Yeah, yeah. The moving average is following your your observation. Uh, you know what was it? What was a uh, uh, just a? This is not going to be as funny a podcast as normal. It's just not. I mean, considering what happened in Dallas yesterday. The, these are funny. These aren't. These are. These aren't funny ever. I, I'm just. Yeah, I'm just saying that. What happened in Dallas yesterday? It has a more somber tone. It definitely has a more somber tone, but I'll tell you, <clears throat> switching subjects on you really quick, this Thomas Perez, um, he's the Secretary of Labor. He comes on after every jobs number, and I mean, I, considering what happened in, in Dallas and then considering uh, the Clinton stuff that came out this week with the FBI and then uh, FBI Director Comey's. Uh, grilling in front of Congress. It's just like it, politicians, this Thomas Perez is a disgrace. Just the way that he talks about the jobs number and just continually going back to how bad it was when Obama took office. So let's say this first. The president has very little to do with economic growth or decline. Very little, in my opinion. I'm going to say that's my opinion. I'm not even going to say it's Mike's or Stafford's. It's mine. Has very little to do with it. He can only sign and veto things, and that's essentially it. Right. I mean, he could sign in legislation that like makes it, uh, you know, reduces regulation and makes it uh, like reduces corporate taxes and which could make it a more pro-growth economy. Or he could sign in legislation that institutes more regulations and more and higher taxes and makes it sort of a, a an economy that would you know, would have more challenges, but the president by himself can't do that. Legislation has to be passed by Congress and has to be initiated in Congress. And so it's not like one one man just says, oh, I want this to happen. And it happens. Right. It has to make it to his desk. And I think, you know, this is an appropriate podcast in a way because the election season is here and the election is nearing. And you sit there and people act like we elect an emperor. And we don't, although I will say, again, in the most nonpartisan way I can, that this guy's acted more like an emperor than anyone we've had lately with all the executive orders. Um, they like to point out that George Bush signed more of them, right? Because they all everything is related to Bush. It's like, get over it already. right? Just get over it. That was eight years ago. 
but they like to say he signed more executive orders, but some of them were for like, you know, a different type of rose in the Rose Garden. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just the comparison's not the same. But again, I'm I'm not Republican or Democrat. I'm not. I'm no. I won't carry water for either of those idiots. During the Clinton hearings today, one of the or yesterday, one of the, I'm sorry, I call them the Clinton hearings. It was Comey, it was FBI Director Comey. One of the congressmen said, you know, uh, Colin Powell had his own server. Go arrest him too. I don't care. Arrest them both. I don't care about the party of them. Arrest them both. Then they're both criminals. And arrest them both. Having said all that, this Thomas Perez today talking about the jobs number to bring it back to markets was an it was an absolute disgrace. Just an absolute disgrace. Talking about last week, you know, last month's number was you know we caution people not to look week to week. You know, one number does not a trend make. Well, the trend's falling, as Mike pointed out four months ago. And now the, the moving averages are pointing out to anybody who's listening. And he just doesn't address it. And just, take you know, taking all the credit when nothing has been done by the government, nor should it be done, because Mike and I both believe in smaller government. Mm-hmm. But nothing should be done. They shouldn't do anything. They should leave us the frick alone so that we can work. And this guy taking credit for a strong jobs number today when the unemployment rate rose from 4.7 to 4.9 because people are finally starting to dip their toe back into the workforce after eight years. They're finally starting to go in and say, maybe I'll try and apply for a job. So the labor pool um, grew. My favorite quote from him this morning was, our economy is so strong because our data collection is so strong. Yeah, I heard heard that one. (laughs) What? Our data collection is so what strong. What does that have to do with the economy? Uh, he's like, we're resilient. Other countries are saying, how can we be like you? Well, you collect better data, I guess. <laughs> yeah, get better yeah, statisticians. Yeah, we've had our humor for the show. They're statisticians, and you'll grow better. It was just a dis- it was just an absolute disgrace. Nothing he said was based on economics at all, and he just co- I just I'm so sick, and it, it makes me turn off CNBC because they put on more and more politicians who just spin anything. You know, it, it's just, it's annoying. It's so annoying. No wonder people are like listening to us. <laughs> it's just so people stupid. People listen to us? Yeah. Well, num- our numbers are, uh, well, our numbers are you growing. You know what? We've come up with the solution for, for the EU then. All they what? have to do listen is to gather more data. <laughs> if they gather more data. They just gather data. data and they'll be fine. Everything they'll, will be that's fine. That's We'll get into this in the show, but that's going to fix the Italian banks. It's going to fix Deutsche Bank. It's going to, you know, the Brexit is solved because all they needed was more data, which actually I think with all their polls that they had every day, they gathered a lot of data. But <laughs> that didn't necessarily fix anything. Uh, one, of the main, one of the main faults of our political system, in my opinion, is that uh, it's one of the main faults and one of the main positives that the president can only serve two terms. So essentially, you you get the economy that you get as a president, and the populace credits them and and blames them when they have so little to do with it from an economic standpoint. It's ridiculous. It's Can ridiculous. I just throw on one other thing political? Shoot. I want term limits. <laughs> For who? Everybody. <laughs> Everybody? Everybody. I mean, you would think that the lack of term limits would make people think long term, and they don't. No. Because they always have something else to blame. Yeah. It's a, it's, it was a, what, what it, I guess we could tie into this now, though, because look at the stuff like this coming out with the Italian banks this week. Mm-hmm. All right. Like they're, and they blame it on Brexit. We already talked about this. I said everything was going to get blamed on Brexit. The, the, the stuff that's going on with the Italian banks didn't happen overnight and didn't happen due to Brexit. It didn't right. happen any – it's been in place, and now they just have a new whipping boy. It's like it's, – it's somewhere – all right, if, if this country, when it does go into the next uh, recession, you know, which I think is going to happen within the next year, it – or then they'll call it – they'll have at some point in the future called it to have happened in the, in the next year. They will have something to blame it on. They will say, oh, well, it, it's XYZ event, whatever that is, because I – you know, it's going to be something. It's not that everything's set up for that. It's not like that we've already been 
uh, expanding. Oh, I don't even think we've been expanding. It's not even like we've been in a bull market for, uh, what, six, seven years now off the lows. So, which, you know, we could, we're, we're due, not necessarily that everything's correlated with bull and bear markets with recessions, but we're, we're nearing, we had, there's a business cycle and we're, you know, we're getting deep into the business cycle. Doesn't mean it has to turn tomorrow, doesn't, but, you know, when it does, when we do have the recession, there'll be something to blame and it's always going to be that way. So, uh, well, you know, yeah, I mean, you're, you're dead on. There's absolutely a business cycle and there's, there's, Crisis cycles as well. We, we've erased all of the Brexit losses now. So oh, yeah. I, I think the Money Path podcast can take a victory lap because right after the vote, Mike and I were both on here saying this is so stupid. Like how much we're moving and moving lower off of this is just so silly. And you can go ahead and say, well, it's currency related, but the pound hasn't recovered. And we talked last week that the pound shouldn't recover. Right? The no. pound is what should get, get affected. Right, the pound, the euro has recovered all of its losses from Brexit. Essentially, oh, yeah. it's missing a little bit, and the S and P five hundred has recovered all of its loss of Brexit, and we're almost at a new annual high. Yeah, um, we're pretty new, close. Uh, five, we we've came within sense of it. What the was high the high? Is, what was the high? Well, the cash high is twenty uh, twenty one twenty oh eight today, and the previous high is twenty one twenty fifty five. So we yep. came within what forty seven cents of it. And how do you like that fast math? Well, I like that. I, you must super, have how many how many fast espressos math. was that? How I'm many espressos? Nine, I'm on nine right now. Nine espressos. Yeah. Well, yeah, and the pound has you know, it's it's come slightly off its lows. It it got slaughtered earlier this week where it touched a low of one twenty seven ninety seven. Now mm -hmm. it's bounced a little back to one twenty nine forty seven. But it's, I mean, pre. Pre Brexit, we talked about this. It was trading up around in the upper 140s. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's it's good. It's going to move, but it's not come anywhere of close to recovering any losses whatsoever. Somehow, Britain found a way to devalue its currency with nobody noticing. That's yeah, a great comment, and they're probably going to devalue it a little bit more. Right. One of the things that the UK is immediately doing is talking about cutting corporate taxes to more along the levels of Ireland, which attracted a bunch of business spending at the time. And you could say that is Ireland going to be a more powerful country economically than Great Britain? Don't they than have England than the UK? I don't, don't know. they have a Trump golf course? They have a Trump golf course. They do. Yeah, yeah. They have so a Trump golf course. There, there's Bring it I back. That was right there with America. <laughs> Bring it, up. Oh. it might be in Scotland. Yeah, it might, be, it Scotland. might be in Scotland. Who, who wants Scotland. to rejoin the EU? So there you go. That's a, <laughs> That says a lot. That ties it all together. But did you know, Bob, for the first time in history, the Swiss 50-year yields have tumbled below zero. So that means their entire uh, – Switzerland's entire yield curve, even out to 50 years, which is their longest-issued bonds, it's, it's all below zero. Uh, shouldn't they just refinance all their bonds right now? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Who would loan a country money for? Well, again, re remember, there's certain people that are mandated. And, I know. And, you know. I'm just. You know why they're mandated, right? Because this was never supposed to happen. Right. Never. So this is a, to me. This is a, the. It's the economic equivalent of a default in a way. Right. Because you, I mean, it's not a default, obviously, but it, a default would be that you don't make your interest payments. And then, you know, the principal is at risk. Well, here there are no interest payments and the pr principal is guaranteed to be negative. Yeah, I guarantee the principal. What would happen in this country? Because we have a lot of pension uh, state and, you know, pension funds that are required to buy bonds. What if we went negative and they, they had, because a lot of these, these uh, pensions have built in 8% annual growth. What, and you're forced to buy bonds. Even now you're forced to buy bonds. Like the 10 year was trading down at 1.38 yield earlier this week. Uh, so if you're forced to buy bonds at 1.38% yield as part of your mandate, you don't have to completely buy it. All, you don't have to have everything invested in bonds, but you have to have a certain amount invested in bonds. So you have a certain rate locked in. Let's just call it a 1.38. And then you have a, you, your annual growth assumptions to keep, you know, based off what you need to pay out 
you need to produce 8%. How, <laughs> what do you invest in <laughs> to make up the rest? Because the rest that's in non-bonds has to make up a lot of that 8%. So, so are you chasing like, uh, pink sheet stocks. <laughs> let's talk about so. Well, let's talk about something completely crazy, right? This is why I want to stay long stocks. It really is because at some point, the only place to get yield is either in high risk debt, ultra high risk debt, right? Which is you can't blow up a pension or the S and P five hundred. It's like the S and P five hundred yields somewhere around three or four percent, I think net net, but. Um, it's going to drive more money into stocks. It is. And at some point, these pensions are going to rewrite their charters. Let's look at what, according to Bloomberg, and this is from 2015. They haven't uh, compiled 2016 yet. Um, the most underfunded pensions, state pensions, okay, this doesn't even include corporate pensions, which are going to be underfunded as well, right? Number one is Illinois. <laughs> Uh, they only fund 43.4% of their pensions. They have an unfunded liability of $82.9 billion right now. 20.7% going unfunded for each person. So each person is about 21% under what they thought they would have as of right now. Connecticut, 55%. All right, they only have 55% of their pensions funded. They're short $20 billion right now. That means the state owes each person on average $56,000 which makes up 18.6% of a person's individual pension. So they're short for each person in their pension fund, $56,000 right now on average. Kentucky, 53.4% underfunded, um, should be 100% so that I'm speaking correctly. Kansas has 56.4% funded. Okay, short, should be 100. Alaska, 54.7. New Hampshire, 57.4. I think we've got the trend. 57.6. Louisiana, 58.1. All right. Okay. 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 Massachusetts is short $75 billion. So So, the fact is, is America is not being run like a business is what you're saying. We're bankrupt. Yeah. Well, you know what? All right, here, I'll have a prediction. If we're a company, you wouldn't buy the stock. I'll have a prediction. Mm Mm-hmm. We're going to see here that this is sort of a tongue in cheek prediction. We see markets go to new all time highs. They re you, we come out with all these funds, you know, piling into stocks, rewriting their charters, everything else. And that's, that's like calling the top tick because yeah, they, I agree. you know that, all right, once everything's piled in. Couldn't agree more, you know, <laughs> get in now though. <laughs> like, you know, as soon as the pensions start announcing, you start scaling out. Yep. Well, right? hey, you, what was I reading earlier this week? Uh, hedge funds have been net sellers this year of stock, and the only group that's completely net buyers are uh, corporate buybacks still. I was reading something along those lines, which is scary in itself. So, I, you, you again, we don't know how long this can go on, but I do not see it ending well. Well, and 2008 was the housing bubble, which was caused by easy lending by Washington, D.C. So anybody, you had a heartbeat, you had a loan, right? So people went way, way over the top. And then they defaulted on that, all that money, and then the government's like, oh, what are we doing? Now, what's the next one? My concern is that it's going to be um, student loan debt. Here's one of the disgraces of our of our society. I think is the cost of college is a disgrace. Um, to to think that it costs three hundred thousand dollars in some cases to educate a kid for four years sounds insane to me. Completely insane. I mean, well, if, if if I had any, if I were emperor, right, I would tell companies. I'll tell you what. Instead of that, um, do some just means testing of kids. Okay, and hire them for 150 for four years and train them in the job or the skill set you need. But what it is, is is they screw the colleges. They passed a law saying that at year 18, you can get a loan. It was just like, you know, you should have a home. Everyone should have a home. 2008. Everybody should have a higher education. You know, 2011. And so, you know, there are kids coming out of school with a, a gender arts degree 
and they owe two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the government's backstopping all these loans and everything, which again they're starting, which again they can't afford, right? Yeah, it, that's one of the reasons. That, hey, you're a private college or everything. You're like, hey, government's handing out free money to kids who want free money in college. Let's just keep raising tuition. They've been doing this for years, and now tuition's through the roof. It's it's why the, I don't think the government should be in the tuition funding role. It's but now we're getting back into. But we're talking about cycles. Yep. And, you know, you're you're going to have a student loan cycle because that's off the charts with debt for these kids. So you get out with what was that degree, Stafford? What the uh... well, there's gender studies, there's gender arts, there's gender, gender, there's, uh, you know, gender, gender. <laughs> yeah. Tr- you know, I can be whatever Listen, gender I, I, I want know somebody on Tuesday. I know somebody who has this. a master's. You ready for this? I know somebody who has a master's in European Union studies. Well, that's going to be really worthless in the next couple of years. <laughs> because I went, I went to her to find out what Article 50 is, and she laughed. She said, it's a blank piece of paper. <laughs> she goes, Article, Article 50 is blank. Article 50 just says you have two years to negotiate what Article 50 is. That's all it says. Well, and what – 6,111 words on cabbage regulations in the EU. Well, you need those cabbage regulations because cabbage, if it's not regulated, can be very deadly. Cabbage regulations. Think about, think about what could happen with coleslaw if you didn't have cabbage regulations. I agree. It could be the wrong consistency. I don't know. The ter- in the beginning of, of America, since we just passed the Fourth of July, you were you were a tradesperson. You were you were in well, agriculture. Alive. I know I'm old, but you, you, no. You then you went into office, and then you went then went back. Right? You you weren't a career politician, and so we've mm-hmm. seen the rise of the career politician, um, and they just love to write laws. <laughs> they just love mm-hmm. it. <laughs> it's all they want to do. It's just write what they laws. Do. Right? So cabbages that is what they do. I want one law that says any law you pass has an automatic uh, two or like two or three year sunset window that if you don't specifically renew it, which has to be done for every law. So essentially either they'd be trying to renew laws, they would never have time to rewrite ones, or if they had spent time rewriting ones, the other laws would just disappear. And we whittle down all of these rules and regulations and everything else. We get back to some se- semblance of sensibility. Well, the sad thing is, is they don't even look back what they passed two weeks ago and are just going to pass a new law. So, yeah, there's, it's not computerized. Once we get computers in there and they can have all the laws hitting in real time, you know, boom, 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 they can go, okay. <laughs> That's these are, all we need. These are barnacles then essentially from the everybody 1800s. everybody violates every law. You know, this is a law how, how wide a, a, a horse carriage should be, the wheels, you know, boom, boom, boom. So it's like train tracks, boom, boom, boom. Where were we? We were talking about uh... – we got sort of off on a tangent based off all this negative yield, and we started about uh, pensions. But, you know, now we have 41% of the total bonds issued trade with negative yields now, which is about $15 trillion. That's- Let me ask you a question. Does this help reduce the debt of these countries? Does people, have a, people have a misunderstanding of debt versus deficit, right? Your average person misunderstands debt versus deficit, and you could think right. of, I mean, if the government collects ten billion dollars and they spend thirteen trillion in one year, they've got a three. I'm sorry, ten billion, and they spend thirteen billion, they've got a three billion dollar deficit, and yes, then that three billion debt. dollar gets added because they borrow money, mm-hmm. right? That three billion dollars goes to the debt. So you can think of debt as an accumulation of all the deficits over the years. Right. So the debt doesn't really shrink. It just stops growing and the debt gets paid down over years. And you can assume that all of it is borrowed money because, um, you know, the, the government always spends more than they collect in taxes. Right. Always. So you can just say that the debt is always accumulated um, borrowing. Right. Uh, the deficits, rather. So when they spend more than they take in. So think about this. A government takes in a certain amount of money. They spend that. They borrow money and they spend that. And then they spend more than that. And then they print some. So they not only spend, you know, you talk about a government having a balance sheet of a house. They not only spend more than they take in, they spend more than they borrow as well, which is an amazing thing. 
Yeah, it, it, America's not being run like a business right now. A lot of these countries are not being what? run like a business. Which which country is? Yeah, I mean, right. Sweden? Sweden? Switzerland? No. 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 Yeah, there, there's this myth of these some of these ultra. What do we call those countries? Nordic. There's this myth of these countries being run correctly and they've got socialist economies and stuff, and all that's now starting to fall apart too. This whole socialist movement with Bernie Sanders and all that, and to a certain degree, Elizabeth Warren, right? I don't want I just don't want to get too political because I hate Trump as well. I hate Trump. I, I hate Republicans and Democrats. I hate them both. But this whole socialist movement, it's like, didn't it wasn't this disproven already with the fall of the wall? The Berlin Wall. I mean, didn't we already try this? And Venezuela is happening right in front of you. History is being removed from the history degree in these colleges. <laughs> these there kids don't even know what the Civil War is. You know, they have no idea about World War Two. You know, unless it was with the movie Pearl Harbor with Ben Affleck. I mean, really, there is a real disconnect with this deeper knowledge. It seems. Well. Here's how bad it was. I pulled up to our local library a couple days ago. There's still libraries? Yeah, I go to the library all the time. Wow. wow. Because my taxpayer money goes to fund it, so I'm going to check the damn books out from the library. Well, there's uh, one where we can save money is close all the libraries, put everything online. Go ahead. But uh, So I pull into the parking lot. Brand new, because it still had a temporary uh, th- uh, tag on it, a temporary mm-hmm. license plate thing. Brand new. S series, 500S series Mercedes. Okay. Feel the burn Bernie Sanders uh, bumper sticker on it. Really? Yeah. I'm like, really? Yeah, but that's a different is- motivation. That could be the, the balding <laughs> white hair contingent. <laughs> no, but really? You want, you want to go full socialism. And you're driving an S-Class Mercedes. So unless you're in the full, unless you're the bourgeoisie in that socialist economy, you're not getting your little S-Class Mercedes. <laughs> yeah, I would have liked to have gone up to that person and goes, that one of those easy, easy remove stickers so you can put it on your used Vega once <laughs> if Bernie gets elected. Because they're going to take this car and sell it to buy some kid's cigarettes. Well, it's, it's not fair. I actually have a point in that cigarettes thing. Mike, do you remember when I told you this? When the Occupy Wall Street thing was going on and they were protesting in front of the Board of Trade, I was walking in in a suit to go do TV, and these guys are just screaming and yelling. And one of the bearded, unbathed kids yells to me, you should pay for my college and you should buy my effing cigarettes. Like, I should buy your cigarettes. And one of the security guards that knows me, he goes, keep. Keep going. I go, I should buy your cigarettes. He goes, kiss, keep going inside. Don't hurt the unbathed kid. When, <laughs> I should buy your cigarettes. When did capitalism not be cool anymore? That blows my when, mind. When they took history out of the history books, Stafford. I think you pointed it out it, when it, it happened. But just the idea of even starting your own company and, and pursuing your own your own dreams and finding your market and and you know engaging that in the whole that takes effort and work. Come on, it's easier for somebody else to buy your cigarettes than to actually <laughs> figure out your own dreams, start a company, and work at it every day. You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take the other side of this for a minute. Um. So I watched a couple of videos from this kid named Bo Buchanan, and he's a really entertaining millennial born in 1990. Um, This kid actually finally verbalized. So I've been an anti-millennial for a long time. If you listen to the the early days of the podcast when Marco was with us, I used to pick on him and he used to just get really upset and sensitive. And this Bo Buchanan in some of his things makes it makes a really so he's an honest millennial, which I think that's the problem number one, is, is there's very little self-awareness in the millennials I've dealt with. I don't want to gen- generalize, but I guess I just did. And he, he goes into this thing where he says, I, I'm privileged, I'm lucky, I was coddled, and I'm unhappy, and I can't figure out why. So he says that in his kind of one-man show thing. And I said, okay, all right, thank you, finally. 
someone who says, I can't figure out why I'm happy. And then he describes this whole thing. He's like, you know, my parents always push me to express myself. And social media is a place where we're allowed to do that without consequences. He goes, where in the days earlier, people would express themselves. And if you expressed against a societal norm, you got societally slapped. And then you learn to not do that in certain places. But social media makes it where you can sing and dance and write and paint and say whatever you want. And none of it is really, there's no repercussions. So when you get into the real world um, and you do that in front of people my parents' age, or like, didn't anyone ever tell you not to do this at work? And the answer is no. You know, he says, I was privileged and I was taught to express myself and told to be what I, I could be whatever I wanted to be. But they didn't tell me I couldn't be it right now. Now, okay, I, I'm hearing Mike's anger already, where it's like, so? Whereas nobody told you, poor baby. I still agree with that part, right? But as I think about what this kid said, I kind of get it. Well, I, I kind of get it. I totally agree. I, I look at it this way, you know, for, for uh, the generation that I happen to be in, the birth of the Internet was my Vietnam, right? Interesting. And, and so that our entire generation X, we had a mission, and at some point, we got the approval of every big bank and institution in the world, and we were validated. It took a long time mm -hmm. to get there, probably a decade. But, you know, we built the Internet with our bare hands. And I don't know what the Vietnam is for this generation. Social media, sure, there are no consequences. There are huge consequences. Don't post anything on there, you know. Mm. I mean, but, but I don't see it being a unification. I watch a lot of YouTube. I don't do Snapchat, but I would do a lot of YouTube. I see what's going out there, and I see how you can make money as an entrepreneurial millennial right now. You know, do mm -hmm. a YouTube channel, work it every day, build an audience, and you will get paid from Ford F-150 ads. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know what the real – so the Vietnam for this, for this millennial generation is use the Internet – doesn't seem like a good rally for me. I don't know. They just they seem to go in thinking that someone should pay them to express themselves. And there's very few people that are willing to do that unless you're in some sort of startup where that's the whole point. And so I encourage these, these kids now instead of like make fun of them. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Start your app. Go ahead. If it works out for you, you're going to be a billionaire and you can hire a bunch of kids like you and see how aggravating that is. When you're trying to get them to do what you need them to do. There's a whole thing where like this whole you know, the, the tech world where the, the, the Googles and the Facebooks have nap pods and all that stuff in there. What these guys don't realize, what these kids don't realize that work there is like Google has a nap pod so you stay at work longer. They feed you lunch so you work through lunch. They allow you to play ping pong because then you'll work till 11. It's still about the work. It's still all about the work. They just have, since they're millennials in, in their way of thinking, they're not millennials in age, but they're millennials in their way of thinking, they're like, okay, this is how we squeeze work out of these guys. But they're still squeezing work out of you. I mean, you're being completely bam bamboozled, right? Because <laughs> it's still about squeezing more work out of you. Well, it's, it's more complex if you want to get psych psychological. These individuals are from single-family homes, so they're looking for a family unit. Interesting. How do we trade this? Uh, I think you, you still got to stay long the stock market. Now, how did we get to this from the Swiss banks being negative yields? <laughs> Swiss well, debt. we should probably touch on the Italian banks since you brought that Ugh. up. What a disaster. Yeah, that's – we'll blame it on Brexit. But uh, so we, if for the people who don't know, we sort of have an Italian banking crisis going on. Uh Let's see some ways to summarize this. Uh, a good way to understand the Italian banking crisis is, is probably looking at the Texas ratio. Do you know what the Texas ratio, Bob, is? I don't. The Texas ratio measures the amount of non-performing assets and loans, including loans delinquent for more than 90 days, divided by the bank's tangible equity plus its loan loss reserve. Okay. A so essentially – when you do this, a ratio of, of bad crap to what you have on hand to cover the bad crap. <laughs> mm -hmm. A ratio above 100% is very bad. Mm -hmm. Seven out of the 47 banks in the Euro stock 600 banks index are currently above that threshold, three of those being Italian banks. And then just outside that top 
seven. Uh, there's two more Italian banks, Unicredit and Intenza. So uh, that's not really good. So you've pretty much the Italian banks aren't good. They have essentially more crap on their books than assets that they can cover the crap. <laughs> uh, earlier this week, Wall Street Journal reported in Italy, 17 percent of the bank's loans are sour. That's 10 times the level that when the U.S., even during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, it was only at 5%. Uh, among publicly traded banks in Eurozone, Italian lenders account for nearly half of total bad loans. <laughs> Shouldn't the EU be trying to get rid of Italy and keep Great Britain? <laughs> yeah, they should. Uh, I mean, what are they so mad at Great Britain for? It's like, no, what so, do they want to get out? I, yeah, well, Bank of Monte, Del. Del I'm good. It's one of the banks in Italy. I can't even pronounce it. Skype it it to me. I'll say it. You really want me to Skype it to you? Please. I want to hear. Could you do it in Italian? Can you do it in? Here we go. It's coming right now. Don't say an Italian word in Italian. This is a cool episode. Yeah, this is cool. No, but but here you go. There you go. Say it. Ah, Banca Monte di Pasci di Siena. Yeah, and so I'll have some. uh, What kind of wine should I have with that? It's not. It's not all food stereotyper. <laughs> you know that's so, it. You know Italian lives matter. You know that, right? <laughs> I don't don't go there. Italian cars I, matter. <laughs> I like that better. <laughs> so they're Italy's third largest lender. Uh, more than thirty percent of the bank's loans have already gone bad. And the uh, EC, ECB has now asked them to slash these non-performing loans by over forty percent over the next three years. <laughs> doubt that's going to happen, but more than 30% of the bank's loans have already gone bad, and they're the third largest lender. This is what's comical to me, and I think this is what the, the socialist kind of movement doesn't understand, is the EU will say that, and then they'll say, we'll bail you out if you'll do this, right? So they'll do it. They'll protect, they'll protect like the bondholders and the rich guys. They'll bail the banks out. Well, if you think about the amount of work the EU put into keeping Greece, and then UK, arguably the second most financially stable country in the EU, oh, you voted us out? Screw you! Tough negotiations, right? Oh, yeah, keep Greece. You brought up the bailouts, right, from the EU? Yeah. Hold on. Under the new EU bailout rule, which took effect earlier this year, that bail-in rule, isn't you it? You need the bail-in rules, which the bank bondholders and shareholders take the losses first before it can be bailed out with taxpayer funds. However, now the Italian government is trying to use an emergency loophole for the rule, and they need they need to get that exception from the EU. So now Italy is going to EU. We're using an emergency loophole because we don't actually want the bondholders and the shareholders to be on the hook for this. And they're trying to use a loophole so that they're not. So we'll have to see how that all plays out. Yeah, any time that you have a regulation with a loophole in it, you don't have a regulation. <laughs> That's it. So it defeats the point of the regulation. That's it. So now they'll pass another regulation to close a loophole. They'll put a loophole in that. It's just ridiculous. This is this is the whole, duh. Anyway, the the whole thing about the Italian banks for me is is they will get bailed out by the EU. The EU will continue to throw good money after bad. And my friend's European Union studies master's degree will be useless. Yeah, I, I, w- I wish will, the EU will cease. <laughs> I I've gone. I went on record when the EU began when the euro currency launched. I remember I was talking to my friend who was at a. a a bank in Luxembourg, and I went to visit him in Luxembourg. He wasn't a friend, he was a client, right? And uh, when the Euro coin first launched, he gave me a bag of Euro coins from the first minting as a gift for um, for coming to visit him, right? We went out to dinner, and he goes, here, I got you something. It was a bag of every Euro coin, right? And I said, well, these are going to be collector's items. This Euro is never going to last. It's lasted way longer. It's been one of my lessons along with Japan. That even when something is doomed, it takes in, – in the, the new global world of politics, it takes – what are we in the euro now? 17 years with the euro coin right now? 1999, I believe, is yep. when it started. So 17 years of the euro coin and it's still here. Um, 20-some-odd years of Japanese bad economy and fiscal policy that mimics our Fed. 
or rather our Fed is mimicking theirs to a certain degree, and now the rest of the Feds are as well. And it just they continue to say, well, this policy can't fail on my watch, right, which is part of the problem with term limits, right? But what are you going to do? I mean, they... <laughs> It's funny why the president gets credit and blame because he has term limits. I'm going back to what we talked about at the beginning of the show. He gets credit and blame because he has term limits. So the congressmen and senators never blame, get blame. Like, oh, we had Obama in office. We couldn't do anything. Oh, it's still Bush. Couldn't do anything. Leave these guys in office till it works or doesn't. And then No, disagree with that one. I oh. think you, you take out their incentive and you take out all the also the rules that they they have separate rules with their own pensions and everything else and their own health care. Well, yeah. You make I them, agree with all that. And stuff. I think it's it's paid, you know, this yeah. I agree with all that stuff. They're, they're, see, I don't have a solution, so that's why I'm not saying term limits isn't it though for me. I think it's, it's it. part of a solution. It's not maybe, the only maybe so. solution. Part of the maybe solution so. is non politicians, not part of the political class. Run for office like it used uh, yeah, to be. Non politicians with a brain. Well, you know, I'm going to retire from my you know shoe business and I'm going to go and be a politician. I mean, that's what you would do. You know, you would have the best people of society who have you know ready for their next challenge and they would do their time and and be be done with it. But boy, it, it's tough if you're not a politician to even have a shot at this thing. Speaking of politicians. Ready it's not for it? Be about politicians at all? Go ahead. No, I, I'm not going to go there though. <laughs> no. It, oh, go ahead. I just, well, since all the politicians and the president's responsible for everything, you know. But uh, uh, you know where I just looked up. You know where this ties in a couple things. What's Deutsche Bank's new recession model now at? They have. A, a, Hundred percent chance. I don't no, know. No, it's, it's it's only for the no for our for the USA. They're predicting a recession, and their model's been pretty decent uh, at sixty percent now. Uh, we've had nineteenth month in a row. U.S. factory orders declined year over year. Uh, in sixty years of historical data, the U.S. economy has never ever suffered a nineteen month stretch of consecutive annual declines. Sort of interesting, but what did the Fed have to say in their meeting minutes this week? Because that's got we we've already overshadowed their. Out those, but their meeting minutes came out, Bob. Uh, let's see. This is not an economy that's running hot. One of the things that was in there by uh, Daniel Tarullo, Fed governor who abdicated patience. That's what it says. Almost all participants judged that the surprisingly weak May unemployment report increase their uncertainty about the outlook for the labor market. Well, they should have talked to Perez, who would let them know that they shouldn't worry about one month. Um, let's see. In the Fed's view, taking another step and removing monetary accommodation should not be delayed too long. <laughs> From December to June, now July, it's not too long. Um, let's see. Others were inclined to leave rates near zero for some time, uh, underscored they would need to accumulate sufficient evidence to increase their confidence that economic growth was strong enough to withstand a possible downward shock to demand, clear reference to what's going on overseas. Um, if, if, uh, if employment growth picks up this summer, members will become more optimistic over the outlook for activity. Well, that's uh, sort of what we saw. We had that. We've now had the jobs report. Came out today, two hundred eighty-six thousand. They're already saying there's been some talk already that rate hike could be back on the table for September. <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. No, no. <laughs> I reserve but the right like to change my view. To one data point. Oh, good data point. It could be back on. <laughs> I know. I mean, and, and again, the, the the disgrace that is Thomas Perez, the Labor Secretary, would tell them that you know you got to look at the trend. Over the last seventy months, we've had declining jobless claims. Uh, he doesn't put in there how many people's jobless claims ran out, so they can't claim anymore. He made no reference to the labor. Um, I'm sorry, the size of the labor pool. Oh, I'm sorry. I know I'm jumping all the way back. This is a little bit to do with what the Fed minutes said. Thomas Perez said, as we near full employment, you can expect to see um, some of these fluctuations, the amount of people hired. He actually said, as we near full employment, with a 64% labor participation rate. Yeah, that's absurd. That's a disgrace. Yep. That's an absolute disgrace. 
to say that out loud, to say that on TV. Unbelievable. Hey, but the good news is June average hourly earnings increase was below ex- the expected 0.2% and only came in expected 1%. Yeah. I'm not putting <laughs> as much into I'm not putting as much into factory orders, although your little note on factory orders is dramatic. I thought it was there's, interesting. There's certainly something there. No, there's something but, there. It's like There is. There's sure. cur- there's currents. There's like these underpinning currents of stuff we've never seen before. It it's like the patient isn't very healthy, but that doesn't mean the patient has to tip over tomorrow. No. I mean, one of the things that's always been weak about the factory orders number, let's say since Stafford, when was the birth of the internet? Uh, uh, when did we, Al Gore invent uh, the internet? Well, no. What when, did was, when did you invent it? The, the internet was um, completely military and educational and scientific, right? And then Congress passed a bill, you know, started by Al Gore, saying, let's create a high-level domain that we're going to open up for commercialbusiness.com, right? And then that mm-hmm. was the official go. That meant anybody who had a business license could do commerce with no tax on this thing, and it took about five years before it started getting like, you know, Amazon showed up. And, and then after 10 years, you could go to your bank online, right? That, that's the kind of high watermark before it started rolling back is once all the banks adapted the Internet. So 93 was the full pass, full business, go for it, no regulation, Wild West. Right, and then the stock market went crazy. It was like, let's all get rich. Let's like, we all need a yacht. It was the '80s all over again. And of course, it blew up, right? Um, but the, the the infrastructure we built, you know, meaning that I, you know, our generation was there at the beginning when it, when we were writing simple code and simple this and simple that. And so I say '93, it was official go from Congress, and then ten years later is kind of like, okay, now we can build from here you know mm-hmm. it's been it's been publicly accepted you see a dot com on every billboard you know it's everywhere you know well here's where i'm going on the factory orders thing is computers and electronic products uh, defense non-defense and the like all computer products right is actually um it's down from 2015 but it's up from last month in a lot of the sections of it when you look at the factory orders number there's so many things in there that would suffer due to increased productivity from tech. So the factory orders number has less weight, in my opinion, than it used to, because computers and electronic products are actually have grown slightly. There were about 200 more units overall from uh, uh, last month to this month's number, and it's been on a steady uptrend. And then there's other things like farm equipment and stuff like that, where unless the the economy is just going absolutely gangbusters, right? F- furniture, you're not going to see growth in those numbers. And I think we all agree that we're in a 1.6, 1.7 GDP, right? So it's not going to hit the other areas of factory orders. So I, I'm not so shocked by the fact that we're in a downtrend in factory orders. That is a big number, though, that you mentioned. So there's something there. You want to? All right, I actually have a good transition here. <laughs> I have a good one. Ready for it? Ready mm-hmm. for it? Tesla. Yeah. And there's all right. You so Tesla shipped fourteen thousand three hundred seventy cars in the second quarter, but it had forecast seventeen thousand. They came out and said they missed a number because about 5,000 cars are still in transit to the customers and they'll be delivered in the third quarter. Uh, so that's sort of not good. All the Tesla stock keeps rallying, I guess, because they're going to buy Soul or a crappy. Uh, uh, Tesla, though, however, plans to ship more than 50,000 cars in the second half of this year. If if they want to hit that target, production is going to have to increase by o- over 70 percent. But that's not even – the most interesting thing, and here's this the big number thing. Tesla expects to begin shipping 500,000 cars per year by 2018. We talked about that a couple of months ago, which is 125,000 cars per quarter, which re- represents over a 750% ramp up in production capabilities from its current delivery numbers. Wow. Yeah. That's, the, that, the that's where I'm tying into that like? interesting number. What does the chart look like? What does Tesla look like? Yeah. Well, it, it keeps rallying. 
Oh, it, well, it hit its 200 moving average again. It's a 217. It's rallied up. It it's it gapped down when it it had that Solar City thing, and then it's which was down to about 206. Now it's back up to 217. What's Solar City then doing? Hmm. I blocked that that symbol out of my head. S C T Y. E Y. That it is. Solar City is still trading 24.32, so it's trading up against the high side of a horizontal channel. Mm. So people aren't really re- people are just buying everything again. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That's why. Oh, no, I mean, I want. I look. You got to buy stocks. I'm sorry. I mean, yep. I don't want to. It's one of these things. It's like this is. They've called this over and over again. They haven't done it lately, but they, in the the first, uh, what's the word? In the early throes of this bull market that began. In the S and P 500, you know, back at whenever it was, 2008, 2009, whenever it was, um, they called this the most hated bull market ever, and I, I still think that applies. I mean, when you look at a, a the way this thing trades, you go back to uh, the low of 2010 or the low of um, 2008 or however far back you want to go. And you look at this market, and there was always this talk of this being the most hated bull market that we've ever seen. And I'm I'm more in that camp now than I ever was. I mean, when we hit you know when we hit the lows in 2009 in March, a low in the S and P of six 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 seven nine, right? The S and P cash, the SPX. Um, everyone hated that bull market. So guy, yeah, you got to buy it. Just everything looks awful, but you got to buy it. It continues. I feel more about that now. After the stock market has has increased threefold, right, from threefold to fourfold is hard for me to stomach with which everything is going on. But you have to be long. What what's going to knock the market down if none of this crap like bad Italian banks and Brexit and police shootings and terrorist activity and crude oil falling and all this stuff? What's going to knock stocks down? Under underfunded pensions and people just buy it. It's we just hit a new and new yearly high. We have a, the high for today is now one cent higher, I think. In the cash. In the cash, yeah. Not not in the futures yet, but the cash you have. I mean, yeah. But yeah, people I mean, are buying everything. Were, like remember, we made the plat the platinum uh, yeah. call last week. Yeah. Which reached its full target uh, two days ago. We mm-hmm. said it could. The possible full target was around 190. It hit mm-hmm. that uh, back on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Now it's trading 1101. So, I mean, you have platinum up, you have gold up, you have silver up. Silver's come a little up, a bit off its highs because it essentially went vertical. Uh, but it's even today, it, it came off its highs from a couple days ago. But it's it's now strongly. Everything's rallying. You know, so you have the market rallying. You have gold rallying, you have silver rallying, you have platinum rallying. Uh, you have the dollar rallying. Hmm. There's a weird divergences and, and um, there's weird divergences. And actually, I, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to get into the what and the why because. Today's edition of the What and the Why is brought to you by Motive Wave Software. Motive Wave Software is a well-established developer of easy-to-use, full-featured charting, analysis, and trading software built for the individual trader. Motive Wave offers the best charting tools used by the pros, such as Elliott Wave, Fibonacci, Gartley, GAN, and Ratio Analysis. There are very strange divergences very going on all over the market. Way. Motive that I wouldn't has necessarily a to fit trade. Any budget and any trading and style. And one of the like, very best features, it's available on like Windows Mike just talked and about dollars Mac. rally. Right? So go to pathtradingpartners.com dollars right stronger, now to get your 14 day having, free trial. By the way, this is my why. And then visit them at Can I start with the why this week. Oh, you can okay? start with the why. You have these divergences. Like Mike said, the dollar is rallying and crude oil is fighting whether to go along with the equity markets. You'll hear a lot of these knuckleheads on TV say that you know stocks and crude are correlated. They're correlated because stocks and the dollar is correlated. A stronger dollar makes for lower crude prices and vice versa. 
And that's because crude is priced in dollars. So when the rest of the globe needs to buy oil, if their currency gets uh, more dollars, it's, uh, it's cheaper oil and vice versa, right? So if the dollar's stronger, crude oil becomes cheaper, right, in the overall market and vice versa. So the dollar's weaker, crude oil becomes more expensive. And you could look at those two charts and they completely coincide. So right now we've got new highs in equities right now, and we've got crude oil struggling to rally. And that's because, in my opinion, because the economy and the global weakness is starting to scare people out of this crude oil trade because the crude oil rally was based on increasing demand and flat supply. People always talk about the crude oil glut, the crude oil glut, the crude oil glut. These guys don't know what they're talking about in terms of what the crude oil market works like. Yes, there's an, a global oil glut. And the production, the marginal producer, again, is the U.S. I saw an article the other day saying that OPEC is still the marginal producers. That person's wrong. Okay, they're not. OPEC is pumping full out. Everyone in OPEC that can pump is pumping because they need money desperately in Nigeria and in Venezuela. Russia is not an OPEC nation, but they need money desperately because the low crude oil prices hurt. Everyone in OPEC, except the kings of OPEC, like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and those guys and, and Doha, Qatar, those guys weren't hurt because they had tons of reserves. The other countries didn't. So crude oil it can continue to fall now if demand is falling. The world is starting to believe Mike's recession theory in the U.S. And uh, people, I think, are split on whether the rest of the world has good economies or not. I think we can agree that the numbers show that Europe is weak, right? So when you have these kind of situations, you have the stock market rallying again on the Fed, okay, that the Fed is out of the picture and that money has to rush into U.S. stocks because there's nowhere else to put it. Mike, what happens when everything runs into one place because there's nowhere else to put it, right? The top. It's not going to end well. It is not going to end well. So you, as much as I've said in this podcast, you have to be long stocks. You need to have your finger on the sell button, not every minute of every day. But, I mean, right now you have to buy stocks. You have to be long stocks. But we have to look for that overall event that's going to push us into the recession Mike sees. I don't see it this year. Within 12 months, I think Mike does. I but see it within it, 12 months. Yeah, I don't see it within 12 months. I don't because I think there's more for the Fed to do. The Fed is still talking. I think they're talking right now. They say we might raise rates in September because they don't have any bullets. So they're like a guy with – like, a, like an old Texas Western where the guy's got two guns and only one has bullets in him. He's still pointing the other gun so that the com person coming up thinking he's got 10 or 12 shots. But he doesn't. He'll only got like three in the right-hand gun, and the other one's empty. So the Fed is talking and saying, we might raise rates in September. Things are still strong, blah, blah, blah. They're not, and they can't. There's no rate hike coming, and they can only cut rates once. So it's going to be ugly. I don't think in 12 months Mike does, but it's going to be ugly. That's my why. It's going to be really ugly when you see crude oil and the stock market diverging because now it's demand. Yep. So we will see. Speaking of crude oil, you know, there was – we broke below one of our trend lines this week. We called out what would – where would be my stop levels on that going to new highs in the short term. And I mentioned we get a close, you know, b below the 45 level. I'd also like to see it close below the 200, which we do not have yet. This close below the 45 level actually triggered a short term trade, though. You spoke of things not it, it triggered a trade that was not actionable to the short side because mm -hmm. you could not get proper reward to risk ratio but the target for that short term trade is about the 4325 level so we could easily see crude if it doesn't hold at the 200 trade down to the 43 level before it needs a reassessment not a yeah. major what but i think more of the what is we could see further weakness in crude however it's not a tradable weakness for me and it's just going to trick go down there and trigger a reevaluation of crude to see what unfolds at that point. It also, there's another key thing is a what, just because a trade has triggered doesn't mean it's an actionable trade because this is a good teaching moment for everybody. You have to take into account your reward to risk ratio, essentially what you stand to gain for what amount of money you're risking, where, meaning your risk is where you would get out of the trade if you were wrong. This trade triggered, and there's nowhere, no way with where I need to have my stop for a short trade 
that I could take it because the profit potential right now we're trading, it essentially would have triggered at, let's see, closing price of 45.19. The target is 43.25, which is what's that? That's under two bucks of potential profit. And the stop had to be much farther than $2 away to, which puts us under a reward to risk ratio of one to one. And we will never take a trade below one to one reward to risk ratio. Yeah. Super important point is that we have a high degree of confidence that it's going to a certain level, but we, and nobody, we don't have a hundred percent degree of confidence and no one ever has a hundred percent on their trading. So because we can't get our trade into the position where we're going to make more than we're going to lose, if it's one of those times that our patterns don't work, we don't take the trade. But, but I agree with Mike 100%, especially if global demand is weakening. I mean, it's, it's an easy trade to see. You know, Mike's looking at it in the charts, um, backing it up with what's happening out there in the world of oil. So um, interesting what's going on. You, I still, you have to be long stocks. I, I mean, I'm going to wrap my thoughts up for the day because this has been a somber podcast and i'm going to wrap my thoughts up for the day with um another espresso because i think i've lost my edge right now but i'm off to get another espresso gentlemen so if you don't need me for anything am i excused i'm bob Icino and i'm excused and who said we ever needed you for anything <laughs> that's huge i just hate you actually I really you know do. We need you for what because this is going to be in the news, I think, for the next few months at least, is to pronounce Italian bank names. Yeah, I'll, I will pro, I will commit to pronouncing all the Italian bank names in Italian if you commit to not have anything to say, which I think I, you haven't said I had yet very little week. to say this week. Did you hear how, <sighs> you how talked little a lot. I had to say? Yeah, you didn't announce that you had nothing to say and then talk for an hour like you normally do. Well, see, when I I felt pressure this week because I did announce that I had not I did not announce that I did not have nothing to say or anything to say. That was almost a quadruple negative, right? <laughs> Somebody once asked me if I was pro gay marriage, and I said that's impossible because I'm pro freedom, so I'm against banning anything that doesn't hurt somebody else. But I'm also sort of weirdly work married to Mike, and I'm very unhappy. So I'm going to go on record as saying I'm against me marrying Mike. I Goodbye, actually have. <laughs> there it is. And I have there nothing to say. And, and there it is. He has nothing to say. And I mean it this time. You never talked about your feelings. I got to go. <laughs> Talk to you guys later. He's going to go have an espresso. I'm going to go cry in my beer. <laughs> <laughs>